If you're visiting here, we want to say a big warm welcome to you. We're thankful um, that you've taken a, a chance on worshiping with us. We recognize that choosing a place to fellowship and call your church is a, a very personal thing. And uh, this pastor is committed to, to creating an environment where the Holy Spirit's welcomed, uh, that we give opportunities for people to come to Jesus through salvation altar calls like we just had. And then we're unashamedly running after him. And when we run after him, he runs after them. And we're so thankful that God does those things. If he has ever done one thing in your life, why don't you give him the biggest round of applause you've given him in a long, long time. Thankful for it. D.L. Moody once illustrated the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives in a sermon illustration he spoke many decades ago. He looked at the audience and in his hand he had a glass cup that was empty. And he asked the question to the crowd, how can I get the air out of this cup? And many people started challenging him on how to get the air out of the cup. One person said, well, you're going to have to vacuum the air out. But he said, well, if you vacuum the air out of the cup, it will shatter the glass. After many impossible suggestions, Moody smiled, picked up a pitcher of water, and he filled the glass to overflowing. There, he said, all the air is now removed. And he then went on to show that congregation how victory in the Christian life is just not, doesn't just happen by sucking things out, but by causing the Spirit of God to go in. If you're thankful for the Holy Spirit, give him the biggest round of applause you've given him in a long, long time. I'm thankful for the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to speak to you just for the next few moments out of the 10 verses in chapter 10 of Leviticus. And what an interesting passage to use on this wonderful Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church. The title of my message is called Strange Fire. Strange Fire, I believe for our definition today, is worship while being in disobedience. I don't want to be a person that offers strange fire to God. Let's read. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized, or some translations say, strange fire before the Lord, which He had commanded them not to do. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, among those who, near, who are near to me I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron, the father of those two young men that passed away in the presence of God, the Bible says, held his peace. And Moses called the other sons and said to them, Come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and Eleazar, to his sons, Do not let the hair of your head, heads hang loose and do not tear your clothes lest you die and wrath come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning that the Lord has kindled. And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Verse number 9. The Lord spoke to Aaron, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, for you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. Let's recap verse number one. Each took his censer and put it fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized or strange fire before the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. These two sons were not minor players in the priesthood. They were sons of the Israel's priest Aaron. They were nephews of Israel's leader Moses. They were the head of Israel's princely elders. The Bible says that they had been on Mount Sinai when Moses and Aaron saw visions of God, and they had been chosen and consecrated to the priesthood. They had stood by and assisted Aaron in the first operations of the Hebrew rituals, and in the whole camp of the Israels, Israelites, only Moses and Aaron were more dignified than these two sons. The fall from the Mount 
of Sinai to the valley of destruction was a steep fall, wasn't it? I want to just take a few moments to look at the meanings of their names and the hopes of their life. Nadab actually means in the original language, willing. But how many know in this room this morning that willing, willingness doesn't equal obedience? Willingness will lead you to the door, but not through the door. There are a lot of people today that serve Jesus, that live in the house of God, but they stay in the hallway of willingness, but never walk to the room of obedience. They falter between two fires. They say they love God and they're in the house, but they ever never walk through the door of obedience. It's the room of obedience that teaches us what it means to wait upon the Lord. The other son, Abihu, means he is my father. We read in, in, in subsequent chapters of this story that neither of these two sons ever realized the promise that God had on their life as a result of their disobedience. One son, willingness doesn't equal obedience. The other son, just because you're called, doesn't equal that you will ever realize your calling. Many are willing, but there are few that are obedient. Or many are called, or few are able to see their destiny fulfilled. Let me lay the groundwork for the ability of, for at the end of this message for me to preach at you. Is that okay? Willingness doesn't equal obedience. If you look up the word willingness in the dictionary, here's what it says. Ready, eager, or prepared to do something. But we recognize that willingness to serve is not the same as obedience in serving. There are many people that are willing to serve Jesus, but aren't serving Jesus because they're not walking in obedience and sur in surrender. Obedience defined. Submission to another's authority. Nadab's life was literally to be a reflection of obedience a submitting to the authority of God's instruction over his life. He settled for willing when he should have been obedient. Many people make the same mistake as Nadab. Many churches make the same mistake as Nadab. Most people will look to our intent and willingness, not our actions or obedience. How many moves of God has God promised to communities where people have been willing but not obedient? There's a difference. You can be in the house that wants a move of God, and you can have a willingness to see it, but it's the obedience that's actually going to take you there. We recognize that both intent and action are important, or action are important in the Word of God. 1 Samuel 16, verses 7 is a famous scripture. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks at the outward appearance. But what does God look at? He looks at the heart. But Colossians 3 and 25 says this, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality in it. Meaning your intent and your obedience are both important. It's God's desire for His people is that they would live not just with godly intent, but their godly intent would meet godly action. Let's turn to the other son this morning. Abihu. Calling doesn't equal realization. Here's what calling defined means. A strong urge towards a particular way of life. I believe that many people know the direction of God, but in the end don't follow the heart of God. It's the reason why so many know the promises of God, but never realize the promises of God. Most people are satisfied with God's presence on them, but, God, but not God's approval in them. Let me give you the definition of a father, an important figure in the origin and early history of something. You know, many of us have missed out on what God wants to, wanted to do through us only to live in the regret of our calling never being realized. This son never realized his calling of being a father, and he had to live with the consequences of his legacy dying with him. Obedience and the heart of a father, listen to me, are essentials, essential ingredients in moves of God. One of the promises found in Malachi chapter 4 is this, and he shall turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Meaning whenever God wants to do a move 
in a community or a region or a world or amongst a people, one of the signs that you'll see is willingness going to obedience, listen to me, and the heart of the fathers turning to their children and the hearts of the children to their father. It's, it's the heart of a father. Well, right, right now we have a lot of sons and daughters in the church. Sons and daughters care about their own future. They care about their own position. They care about, they care about the things that they want. Fathers and mothers in the church don't care about their own position. They care about the legacy coming behind them. And right now we have a lot of, a lot of our church songs are, are geared towards I and me and what can God do for me and I. It's really the heart of a son and daughter being displayed. My, my son Jay says, great of a kid as he is, he'll never walk into my room or, or when I'm sitting on the couch and he'll never look at me and he'll go, Dad, what can I do for you today? <laughs> if you've got your kid trained like that, hat tip to you. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. Really what ends up happening is Jace will come in and he'll go something like this. Hey, Dad, how are you? And the moment that he does that, do you know what he wants? He wants something. And usually it's like, give me VC, give me virtual currency on Xbox, or I need, a, I need a new Fortnite game, or I need this, or I need that. And he'll go, hey, Dad, how are you? And what most of us do when we come to church with our Heavenly Father is, hey, God, how are you? I know I haven't really talked to you in the last six days, but I'm hoping that today you will answer these set of issues and problems. But really, it's the hearts of sons that turn into being hearts of fathers and the hearts of daughters that turn into be hearts of mothers that is a sign that a move of God is getting ready to happen. It is, it is, it is a heart of a, a father or, or, or a son or a daughter that says, I want the kind of music that I want. I want the kind of church that I want. I want the kind of ministry that I want. And the Bible talks about in the last days that there'll be, te- there'll be uh, people that will heap into themselves teachers that will want to scratch their ears. Or in other words, there is going to be a lot of sons and daughters that will be coming to the church that say, God, give me what I want. And what we have to pray for in this Holy Ghost move is not a son and daughter mentality, but a father-daughter or father-mother mentality. We've got to have the ability to say, hey, we don't care about my future or my preferences, but we care about the move of God that's supposed to be coming behind us. That's a good place to give Jesus one of the biggest rounds of applause you've given him all day. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let me give you the moral of the story. The moral of the story is they went to sacrifice and pray, but God was more concerned that they obey. Many people will try to pray and sacrifice their disobedience away. I want you to listen to me all across this room. Prayer is wonderful. Sacrifice is even okay in some circumstances. But prayer and sacrifice will never ever substitute our obedience to God. You, you hear in this pastor. You have to understand that it is important that you and your personal walk with Jesus understand the importance of walking in obedience. Shortcuts are costly. Jesus is not a shortcut cheat code to play to get out of trouble. Jesus is a savior to surrender to, not like a genie in a lamp to rub. The Bible says that Aaron held his peace. There's only here in one other place that I can find in the book of Leviticus, it is said that the Lord spoke directly to Aaron without the mediation of Moses. It was really the original, ready for this one? Hold my beer moment. Some, some theologians say that the reason why the, 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 the statute of, of priests not being able to drink wine or hard liquor happened because of what happened with these two sons. Why is it that after this happens, they have to make a rule about not drinking alcohol? Probably because someone said, hold my beer, we're going into the Holy of Holies. And God, what did God do? I, just on a side note, I've never heard anyone in the church, as I have all these years of counseling, get liquored up and drink and go, I made a really good decision after that. (laughs) It's usually usually when a poor decision's getting ready to happen. Probably something that you should probably stay away from. All right, stepping on toes here this morning. (laughs) Their big mistake came from their inability to discern between common and uncommon. These two sons had to have had immense conversations about certain things about like, why can't we go in there and meet with God? Well, why is it only my dad can do it? 
And could you imagine being Aaron in that moment? Two sons that were raised in the priesthood, that saw God move on Mount Sinai, not realizing the importance of obedience. The questions that Aaron must have had. Did I do enough? Did I say enough? Did I warn my kids enough? Did I, did I not talk to them about the holiness and reverence and fear of God that's needed to be next to him enough? In the end, we recognize that there are no grandkids in the kingdom of God, and every person must make a choice. Every young adult, every young married couple in this room, I want you to listen to me. You are going to have to make a choice to serve God for yourself. And if you want a revival like the generation above you had a revival, you're going to have to learn how to walk in a new level of obedience. Church just can't be something that you fit in your schedule. Praying and reading your word just can't be a good idea that you do every once in a while. God will not give a, a group of people the promise move of God who passively walk in their relationship with him. It's serious business. What I don't want is I don't want to create a culture or have a church that's okay with strange fire. We come in on church on Sunday morning and we go through the motions and we know when to wave our hands and we know when to lift our hands and we know when to answer altar calls, but yet on Monday through Saturday, our life is living in disobedience. Do I need to go a step further there this morning? If you're having sex outside of marriage, that's disobedience. If you're gossiping about someone in church, that's disobedience. If you're not giving to the Lord with your tithes and offerings, that's disobedience. Have I made everyone mad yet here this morning? Almost, yeah. I've got to keep going down the list, yeah. What we don't want is we don't want a church that is okay with worshiping God and asking for the fire of God on Sunday but living in disobedience Monday through Saturday as if God doesn't see or can't sense what kind of worship you're walking in. I'm trying my hardest right now. And I want to give you just a note. If you're not willing to speak up and confront your children before poor decisions are made, it's probably a good idea to stay quiet after the poor decisions have been made. I felt the Holy Spirit as I was preparing this message I have this word bolded in my notes. Now is the time to speak to your children. Now is the time to speak to those around you that are heading towards the day when they will weep, reap what they will, will sow. Do you know the devil's favorite word? It's tomorrow. I'll confront my kids tomorrow. I'll confront my brothers and sisters tomorrow. I'll confront my spouse tomorrow. I'll confront that person tomorrow. And listen, when I'm saying confront, confront is not a bad thing. Confront with love is what God has called us to do and what if, if we want to see what God has for us, we have to be willing to speak up. See, Scripture doesn't exactly say what happened of why these two sons had the wrath of God put on them. But let's look at some of the possibilities this morning. Do you know that when you mix passions, you are in the danger zone? One possibility is that they used coals in their censers that sort of look like gold pans to light the fire at the altar that came from somewhere other than the altar. Do you know that mixed focus is a dangerous game to play in our walk with God? What we don't want is we don't want to have in our lives this double-mindedness where church and our relationship with the Lord and relationship with other believers is something that we think that we could passively walk out. What I want everyone to know in this room is you better be careful when you're living a life that has mixed passions or focuses. Well, what does the Bible say? You've got to seek first what? The kingdom of God. Not seek first 1A, 1B, and 1C. We recognize that when you mix passions, you're in the danger zone. Another possibility is this. When you mix timing, you're in the danger zone. One theologian says, perhaps they may have offered at the wrong time of day. See, intimacy, let me give you an example. Intimacy is reserved for marriage, and if you step out of timing, you better beware. So what happens for some of us is not that God doesn't, God doesn't frown on intimacy, He created it. But if the timing of intimacy is wrong, you better watch out. And so what we learn from these two sons is, possibly, is when you mix the timing or the cadence of your life, you can be in the danger zone. 
The third possibility is this, is when you mix roles, you can be in the danger zone. It may have even be that they sought to go in the most holy place, and by doing so, usurped the prerogative of the high priest on the day of atonement. I want you to listen to me. If you live in envy and judgment of someone else's giftings in the church, or someone else's talents in the church, you better duck. Because God, God's desire for us is not to mix roles, just to be uniquely the person that God's created you to be. The moment that you start wanting to be somebody else, what you're doing is taking your hand and slapping the face of God and saying that God made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. You are uniquely and wonderfully made. If you don't come in the church and do what God's called you to do, it's not like the church is going to fill your spot because your spot cannot be filled. That's how unique and wonderful you are. So you have to be confident in knowing who you are in God. The fourth option is that when you mix common with holy, you are in the danger zone. The command prohibiting the priest from drinking wine or other fermented drink may suggest that drunkenness was a possible factor in their sin. In today's world, we have traded a form of Christianity that mixes the common with the holy all the time. The permissible or the allowable in our faith, we oftentimes mix with the fervor of an all-in relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you something really quickly as I just pause in this moment. You will never have the kind of relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit that you want if you're not willing to go all in. All in isn't just giving God just the sins that are in your life. Going all in is saying, God, I give you my preferences. I give you my talents. I give you my abilities. Listen to me. I give you my time. I give you my hopes. I give you my dreams. God, I don't want to do that if you don't want me to do it. I don't want to go on vacation that weekend if you don't want me to do it. God, I need your wisdom over my life. There is nothing that is off limits in a believer's life that's committed to Jesus and has gone all in. Nothing. I believe that our world needs us committed to holy fire. Many have chosen to live between two fires or two passions. But as we've talked this morning already, we understand that mixed living is dangerous. You know, fear of man and love of self have caught too many people between two fires. The closer that they got to the cross, the smaller the crowd was. By the time that they were in the upper room on that day of Pentecost, only a handful of people remained focused on the fire. Pentecost fire is available to the obedient, the patient, and the person who's ready to believe that God has something more for them. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43 tells us about the kind of perspective that we should probably avoid. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But listen to me. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. They were more concerned about their position with man than their position with God. My mentor, Donnie Moore, says it like this. So many people today would rather face the judgment of an angry God than face the possibility of a displeased friend. Many pastors would rather face the, the, the picture or the face of an angry God rather than the part of an angry congregation. In my, in my, in my uh, Bible reading this, this month, I've been in the book of Numbers, and this, this picture came out in the book of Numbers of, of Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb throwing themselves on the ground before the people, begging the people not to go back to slavery in Egypt. And the people of the Israelites were, were trying to summon a leader among them that would be willing to take them back to slavery. Think about the picture of that group of people that thought it was better to live in slavery rather than freedom. And what we need today is we need not just church members that aren't scared of, of, of the mission field that God's called them to. We need preachers and pastors who are not scared. 
who allow place for the Holy Spirit to move in a church, that, that offer altar calls. Here's the one thing that I will commit to you as my pastor. There will never be a Sunday where we don't give an altar call for someone to come and know Jesus. As we were talking about staff today, or this week about today, we were talking about what happens if no one raises their hand for salvation, or what happens if we commit to this and it gets awkward when no one comes forward. And my, my, my wisdom and counsel for our staff is this, it is not our job to produce the results. It's our job in faith to cast the nets. And we are going to believe that we are going to become a church where every Sunday people are going to give their hearts to Jesus. I got seven of you with that, all right. <laughs> holy uncommon fire will never come with unholy common expectancy. It's going to take all of me for all of him. The day of Pentecost was a powerful example of what God can do with all of his church. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Pentecost. What an incredible birth of the church in power. A number of pastors and leaders met recently and the question was asked, what is going to happen to America? One pastor said Christianity in America has less than 10 years. Another said the church will be forced underground in less than a decade. Another well-known pastor said, well, the church, what we need is we need more resources and money. Another pastor said, well, what we need is we need more political influence. Another said, you know what our churches need is actually more talent. I would like to tell those pastors, we need to understand that our condition is impossible right now. There's no counsel, there's no human effort that will turn America around. The bad news is it looks impossible. The good news is, is God specializes in the impossible. This pastor's coming to you on Pentecost Sunday, and what I'm telling you the church needs is the church needs the power of God. Not political persuasion, not trendy churches, not watered down, palatable sermons. What we need now more than ever is the power of God active in our churches. The idea that getting America's attention is by shortening services so, so that people will come and, and pop in and pop out. I want to just be very clear about my position. Shortening services as a, as a strategy to get the church more focused on Jesus is absolutely absurd, and it will not work. Mixing your focus is not creating focused Christians, but actually more distracted ones. I'm old enough to remember when the church would meet on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We'd have revival meetings and prayer meetings, and what we said was, we were too busy, so let's give our families to the world. Let's let them play Little League and let, let's let them play AU basketball and let's let them go on band trips on the weekend and let's, let's have family barbecues on Sunday night and let's let the church relax and take a few moments off. And what the church did was become more busy. We became more distracted. We became people that have funded more things outside the church than inside the church. The answer, listen to me, the answer is not creating a more trendy church. The answer has and always will be the power of God hitting the church in the last days. I liked one quote by a man I used to go to church with. He said, men will not go to church if it's too long. They will drop the kids off, but then they'll go watch a three-hour football game. Think about it. If your kids see you excited everywhere else but the house of God, you are in the danger zone and you are worshiping with strange fire. According to one of our major theological schools, church needs to be quick. It needs to be short. No threatening remarks need to be made from the pulpit. I've, we're in trouble. Church must be explainable. One theologian or one major theolo theological professor said, but I want you to know it's the power of God that gets people's attention. 
It's not when the church is explainable that it's compelling. It's when the church is unexplainable that the church is compelling. It's when she breaks the laws, breaks the rules. It's when God does something that is not, not tied to anything on earth. That's when the church is at its greatest. Let me give you an example. When you really think about some of the stories in the Bible, like the one I'm about to share, Pharaoh was scared to death of Moses because Moses had been to the burning bush. Pharaoh couldn't explain how an 80-year-old man pointing a stick could open an ocean. They don't teach you that in Bible college, do they? You know, it's always been impossible for the church under Nero, under Hitler, under communism, in China, in Muslim nations, in economic downturns. It's always been impossible for the church. But when God is ready to move, He will move even when it's impossible. This, I've got to see. That is what we want the world to say about Parkway. This is what they must say when they see black, white, Asian, and brown people all worshiping together. This, I've got to see. When someone gets off of heroin in one step instead of 12. This, I've got to see. When the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear, this, I've got to see. When a gang member, a God-hater, an atheist, a devil worshiper are kneeling at an altar and getting saved, this, I've got to see. When a wife beater gets saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, this, I've got to see. When a family prioritizes the things of God over sports and recreation, this, I've got to see. When a church returns to their first love, this, I've got to see. When God puts a marriage back together, this I've got to see. When a lost child comes home that's been away from the Lord for decades, this I've got to see. When a youth group explodes with lost young people, this I've got to see. It's because this I've got to see is a result of people declaring, this is who I've got to be. If you love Jesus, give Him the biggest round of applause you've given Him all morning. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. I want to ask you a question as I round third base and head towards home. What do you think was going on in that upper room when 120 individuals were like a flea on an elephant's back? When the world's most important religious feast at Pentecost is going on outside and thousands from all over the world were there, listen to me, in the, in the religion, in the religious feast of willingness. But actually only 120 people were actually being obedient. I wonder what the conversations were like as they waited. I know that when I pray in English, I run out of words. And I'm thankful for that heavenly prayer language that God's given this pastor. I was on the 10th floor of the Oakland hospital and they said my son was never going to walk again. Size him for a helmet, put him in a wheelchair. And I cried out to God and I cried out to God and then I lost the words and I kept crying. And I started praying with moanings and groanings that could not be understood. I'm thankful that Pentecost is still alive today in our world. What would it have been like to have been in that upper room when every religious person said he's gone? He's not coming back. The church that you know is dead and gone. But 120 of them remained faithful because of a promise that Jesus gave them. What is the hope that 120 people are going to turn a generation's neck because a fire was going to appear over their heads. It was a fire that did not need fuel. A fire that vi violated the third law of thermodynamics. It was a fire that was not on a bush, but on 120 believers that began to speak the word of God with boldness, violating the laws of sociology. They did everything opposite of what the religious people of that day taught. 
they got up in an upper room and they waited. Pastor, if you wait and you give altar calls at church, the crowd's going to dwindle. Pastor, if you preach about people's sin, they'll stop coming. Pastor, if you talk about giving, they won't be here. Every time the religious people of this world tell you to do something that's opposite of God, my job is to stand on the foundation of this word and declare this, you're about to see. You're about to see something that is unexplainable. How could that church with that young pastor experience that kind of move? How could a young man's back that was looking like an S get straightened? How can blind eyes be opened? Not one of us in this room can take any credit for that. But people, when they walk in here, they go this, I have to see. How is it that they are speaking from our village, our dialects, telling of the mighty works of God, and how did 120 people go global in one day? Talk about a viral sensation. I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the hope of Parkway turning a generation's neck? What is it going to take to move a valley to the foot of the cross? It's going to take a this, I have to see moment. The Bible says in the last days, you will see a death of passion and absence of emotion. Would you listen to me? The Bible says that the love of many will grow cold. Or they will have the inability to fill things. Even some of them will have trouble filling the presence of God. Unloving means that they've lost the power to feel beauty or to be moved by a sunset. Why would people, why would young adults lock themselves into their rooms for six and seven hours and play video games, but never gaze upon a sunset and go, that's incredible? You know why? It's because we're living in the last days. When you see the Bible says a lack of passion hitting a culture, you know that you're living in the last days. Unloving means a part of them has permanently died where they don't notice the laugh of a child, the ocean, a waterfall, the feeling of family. It just comes from life and they've lost it. One of the greatest sounds in the church happens, Paul, in the last 10 minutes when you hear kids crying all over the sanctuary. Because if you don't hear the church crying, the church is dying. And I love that we have young families here that are bringing their kids and raising them in the church. I'm thankful that I can still notice the cry of a child, the laugh of a child. I'm so thankful that when two young people answer that altar call this morning, there wasn't a dry eye in that section right there. Why? Because passion is rebirthed when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our life. In the book War and Peace, Napoleon said, I have lost the power to think in decent thought. In the last days, it says, they will be ungrateful. Do you recognize that if you can't feel gratitude, you can't feel the meaning of anything? The Bible says that they'll be unforgiving. They won't forgive one another. Hate will ruin their hearts. Do you know that the church of today, what's made more popular amongst young adults that don't come to church is how we treat each other in the church? We're known because we can't forgive. And hate has ruined our hearts. The Bible says that the days will be perilous because of an emotional war that will destroy all natural affection. Let me recap. Men will be unloving, unforgiving, ungrateful, and ungodly. And in the last days, one of the greatest battles that is taking place is the battle for passion. What are people passionate about? We're passionate about complaining. We're passionate about unforgiveness. We're passionate about being ungrateful. We're passionate about our style. But are we passionate about the Holy Spirit? It's why I can preach and no one claps. It's why we can worship and you don't raise your hand. It's because 
You're living in the last days. It's why I can challenge and no one will rise to the challenge. It's because these are the last days. But I'm thankful that as the Bible talks about these things that are going to be part of the last days, I'm thankful that I live in these kinds of last days. That in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men will dream dreams. I'm thankful that God's put me here for right now to see the greatest move of God that has ever hit our world. If you're thankful for it, I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to give Jesus the biggest round of applause you've given him all day. Hallelujah. 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 The church, when we are passionate for God and passionate about the things of God, the world will stop and look and say, this I've got to see. Here's my prayer this morning. God, make me a this I have to see believer. A this I've got to see moment. Listen to me can happen right now. If you believe that, would you shut your hands towards heaven? Let's take 60 seconds and invite the Holy Spirit to come. You're welcomed here. I know what people in this room are saying. I've got, I've got to go. I've got lunch appointments. I've got places to go, people to see. But I declare in front of these wonderful people this morning, Father, you're what we want to see. Here's what we want to know. God, I don't want to live a passionless existence as a Christian. I don't want our church just to go through the motions and not want to invite you to come. But Father, would you come? I don't want you for, for the ability to speak in tongues. I don't want you for the ability to lay hands on people and they'll recover. I don't want you for the abilities, for the blessings that you'll give me. God, I just want you for you this morning. If you just want him for him this morning, would you stretch up your hand and tell him? Say, Heavenly Father, I just want you this morning. I want to know you like I've never known you before. I want to experience you like I've never experienced you before. I watched last night as the Boston Celtics played the Miami Heat. And I watched passion at the end of that game go bonkers as a Boston Celtics player made a tip in at the buzzer. I want to take 60 seconds here and with the greatest amount of passion you have, I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit in this room with the greatest round of applause you've given him in a long, long time. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! That's good for a Baptist church. You're a Pentecostal church. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Would you sing it, bro? Pastor's hearts. 
This is gonna be our dismissal for today. I recognize with Memorial Day weekend and family plans and barbecues, there's no condemnation. If you feel like you've gotta slip out, but this is gonna be your dismissal. But I would be doing what's in this room in injustice and I wouldn't be honoring God by telling you that there's a this I've got to see moment about to hit this service. And I don't need you to wait. I don't need you to hesitate. But if you want to be one of those believers, those upper room believers that believe that what God wants to do through us and in us can only happen by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. I don't want you waiting in your chairs. I don't care how many altar calls you've ever answered. But right now, if you want to be part of what God is doing in this place, in this moment, I don't want you to hesitate. I want you to come forward. And I want us to worship together. Don't wait. Don't wait. If, I want you to come right now. All across, upper deck. Come. Come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.